Hello, everybody. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. This is part 14 of our look at Return of the Divine Sophia. Today is Wednesday, December 14th as well. Two 14ths here. And this is actually my paternal grandmother's birthday. She's no longer with us. She passed away a little over a year ago. Um, I've spoken about my grandmother, Mary Ann, a lot. Uh, she was my I think probably my muse, <laughs> she made it okay for me to be a bit of a weirdo growing up in upper upper middle class Southern society and private schools and playing piano and going to country clubs. She made it okay because she herself questions life. She taught me about reincarnation when I was a child. She hid books on reincarnation under the bed for my grandfather. She played the piano at church on Sunday, but she very much believed in a bigger picture of life. She believed more than what the church taught her to believe or what society taught her to believe. Out of all of my guardians, out of all my grandparents and parents, she was the one that was very supportive of me going to India to study. And every time I came home from India, she wanted me to tell me all that, tell her all that, that I had learned, right? She got it. She absolutely got it. And um, she was also, she also went to university at a time when women did not go to university. Not only did she go to university, but she graduated valedictorian of her class, even against the boys. Again, she was a master piano player. She had her master's in psychology. She tried to teach me how to meditate when I was a child. So she, she definitely was a very powerhouse alpha woman with her pearls on, always had her lipstick on. And I just, I honor her and I thank her for paving the way for me to be able to be the weirdo that I am today. I think out of all of my grandparents and parents and aunts and uncles, she was the least offended when I got a tattoo. So I am super, super grateful to have had her as one of my um, role models in my life. And so for my grandmother, Marianne, Marianne, thank you. I know you're watching down. I know you're protecting me. I know that you're reunited with, with granddaddy and you know, the day she died, she actually died on her wedding anniversary. And my grandfather died back in 2017. Um, and she died in 2021. And she had dementia, Alzheimer's, when she, her brain, her mind was going. And uh, every day after my grandfather died, she would kind of forget that he had passed away. And it was kind of this, this torture to have to remind her that he was no longer here. But the day that she herself passed away, apparently that morning she had told, um, some of the nurses at the assistant living home that she was going to go see Ed today. Today she was going to go see Ed, my grandfather. And they just thought it was a typical day where she forgot that he had passed away. Well, she ended up passing away that afternoon. And when she passed away, it was my dad and his sisters that told them that today that was their wedding anniversary. She was going to go see her sweetheart on their wedding anniversary. My grandfather was, I believe in the military when he met my grandmother, he was coming through the town where my grandmother's university was and there was a house party and my grandmother was playing the piano at the house party. And my grandfather thought that's the girl I'm going to marry. The one who's playing the piano at the house party. At that time, she was actually dating somebody else. <laughs> but I guess scandals like that are not new to, to our human story. And I'm really glad that she, uh, she stopped dating the other man she was dating and started dating my granddad because I would not be here today if, if it wasn't for her making that decision to leave the person she was, she was dating to go for that six foot five tall man named Ed Watson who came walking through the door in the military um, in that house party where she was playing the piano. Um, there's funny stories. She grew up on a, a, a old plantation house down in South Georgia, Quitman, Georgia, which is near Valdosta. Her grandfather, my great grandfather, Paul, Paul Bennett owned a dairy farm and, um, they were Protestants, but Democrats. Well, my grandmother was dating before she met my granddad. She was dating a, um, Democrat who was Catholic. And apparently my great grandfather really had a problem with the fact that he was Catholic. <laughs> but my grandfather, Ed Watson, was a Republican, but he was a Protestant. He was Presbyterian. So my great-granddaddy was uh, 
was 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 content that that this new man even though he was a republican at least he was a protestant i just think those stories are so funny they're so funny um the way we were in our societies but anyway so this goes out to my grandmother marianne watson marianne bennett watson who um was quite a trailblazer for her time she figured out meditation before meditation was even known in the Western world. She studied reincarnation before many even pe people even knew what it was. She went to university. She graduated valedictorian of a university class. She worked her whole life. She joined the Rotary Club, which is a business club as a woman when women were not workers. She raised three children. She has six grandchildren. Um, and she has three great grandchildren now. And so her legacy lives on through us. And so thank you. Grandmother Marianne, I know you're I know you're watching. I know you're here. Thank you for being so supportive of me. Out of all of our your grandchildren, I was the weirdo. I was the one that questioned things. And I think you felt um like you had a, a soulmate in me. And I think that you I know you didn't have favorites amongst your grandkids, but I know that you shared stuff with me you didn't share with everyone else. And so I thank you for trusting me with that. And I thank you for lighting that fire under me that sent me all the way across the world to study and answer the same questions or ask the same questions that you too asked, mm -hmm. even though you didn't have the ability to just travel to India, but you, you, you karmically gave me that, that, that spark to do that. And for that, I will be absolutely entirely grateful to you and for the, the path that you paved so that I could do that in my time. And, um, and I thank you for being around me even today, even, even in death your spirit is still around me and um, protecting me and helping me. And I will always love you. All right. With that being said, let's get started with the divine Sophia, because I think my grandmother, Marianne would have loved this stuff. I think she would have been really into all this stuff. So today we're going to be starting with chapter 17, which is the divine daughter and son on my book. This is page 325. Only when we begin to understand how vast the mother is, will we begin to understand how powerful she is and how powerful we, her divine children, can be when we surrender to her, guided by her, infused with her immense, passionate, and transfiguring sacred force, and bearing and Andrew Harvey, the Divine Feminine. As I contemplated what I had learned thus far about the Divine Mother hidden even in Christianity, this led me to consider all the many ways in which she had been worshipped in the world. Of all of her aspects, I was most drawn to the goddess of wisdom, Isis, Sophia, and Mary. These women seem to be incarnations of Ariel, the creatress of life, the profound spirit guide who had transformed my life. This led me to think about the true nature of Mary Magdalene. Like most of us, I had been raised to believe that Magdalene was a fallen woman whose wayward path had been redeemed by Jesus. I wondered how, after all these centuries of shame, and degradation, I was to ever discover the truth about who she really was. As I began to study the Gnostic teachings and the collections of her sayings, I realized that the wisdom she had taught had been just as profound as Joshua's teachings. Once a disciple had asked Magdalene, how can I come to know the Lord? And she replied, become empty like a cup and let the mother spirit pour the Lord and her presence into you. I realized then that my own innate prejudice, conditioned throughout a lifetime, had only taught me to acknowledge God as male. To truly understand and embrace her, I would have to open my heart. Around that time, Ariel appeared in my dreams. One night, I found myself walking through a beautiful garden full of honeysuckles, violets, and orchids with a lily pond to one side. I came upon a mysterious archway covered in vines. A radiant female figure stood before the archway, but I could not tell if this being existed in this world or in the next. She was delicate and smelled of flowers, and her robes looked Asian, like a china doll's. Who are you? I whispered, almost afraid to breathe. Her smile released the radiance of love wafting out across the small distance that separated us. Do you not recognize me? She asked telepathically. Ariel, is that you? Yes, it is I. But why are you dressed like that? I didn't just mean the Asian satin robes. I meant her Eastern appearance. In this incarnation, I am known as Kuan Yin, the Bodhisattva of compassion. 
bodhisattva of compassion? Yes, bodhisattvas were soul who were entirely freed of the wheel of karma, but had returned to earth to help humankind. There was no greater sacrifice. In coming back to earth, they took a chance that they would forget their heavenly origins and become trapped in the worlds of illusions again. And this is what Ra talks about as well in the Law of One. That a lot of us came back from the sixth density to help humankind, but in doing that, we ran the risk of getting caught back in the samskark wheel of karma. But you are the mother of creation. Why would you choose to take a human form? Even as I spoke, she began to morph, becoming the Native American teacher called White Buffalo Calf Woman. Suddenly, there were teepees in the landscape behind her and smoke rising from a distant fire. I jerked backwards. Now she had long, dark hair and buckskin clothes, a strong jaw and a chiseled nose. She was holding a long peace pipe. Ariel, why do you look that way? Are you White Buffalo Calf Woman? Her mouth turned up in a mysterious smile. Why do you think I am, child? She seemed to be hanging a white cowhide up on a line. Then before I could even digest what I was seeing, she morphed again. Now we stood together floating down the waters of the Nile on a graceful reed boat with a curved prow. Hieroglyphics were painted on the hull and a lantern hung from the nook at the front of the boat used to navigate the waters in darkness. But when the sun was shining and a canopy of red and blue fabrics shielded us from the sun rays, keeping the glare from our eyes, we seemed to be in Egypt. Mother, I whispered, where are we now? Although I knew before I said it, the blue waters of the Niles drifted around us and on either side of the river, the brown desert sand floated by. Ariel was clothed as a graceful queen in white linen dress and a gold belt with the laced sandals on her feet. Two armbands wound around her arm. Around her neck was a sunburst collar of lapsus, carnelian, and gold. And she turned in reassurance. Isis? I stammered, although I knew that it was Ariel, the same exquisite energies of unconditional love radiated out of her. Welcome, daughter, to the land of rushes, to the gentle papyrus boats, to the low-flying shallows, and lingerous days of beauty. Come, allow yourself to float as we once did down the Nile. I was too flabbergasted to speak. I had long suspected that I had lived as both a queen and a priestess in Egypt, but somehow I knew that this was beside the point. You asked me once if we had an incarnated in Egypt. Indeed, we did. Did Isis, whom you know as Isis, not embody me? One heart for her people, for her son and husband, and for the truth above all? Was she not the teacher of healing love and immortal life? She was with her wise son, Horus. Are you Isis? I stammered. My hand was swirling. Wasn't this Ariel? Yes. Whom did you think I was? Ariel, the divine mother. And is this not the same as the goddess Isis? You have sought to understand her nature. Then look at my own. Look at your own. Isis was the divine embodiment of the sacred mother for her people, living it, breathing it, being it. She was an incarnation of you? Was this why Ariel had revealed herself in three different forms? Yes. Even as Horus was an incarnation of Rajal, the father, who was also the son. Divine wisdom, divine truth, we came to earth together at that time. My thoughts were swirling, but why? Why did you come? To rebuild the planet, of course. To rebuild the age. All had been wiped clean in the great flood, and your precious earth cried out to the heavens, and her cry was answered. Are you the female Christ? I asked softly. Yes, I am the mother of creation. Whenever you would rebuild, you must first have a generator. The heart is the generator. I am the heart. Why are you showing me this, Ariel? Because you are the same. The same? What do you mean? I mean that you too carry the sacred heart within you. You carry the compassion and wisdom of my teaching. And because my heart was there in Isis, this means that you were there as well. I struggled with this concept. What did she mean? Are you saying that I am Isis? 
No, I am saying that Isis embodied my heart, the heart of divine service, and that you do this as well. Thus, you are one and the same. For the first time, I glimpsed how she might have incarnated in three different cultures. Are you saying that you have lived as each of these female masters? I am saying that the heart that beat in Isis and in Kuan Yin and, what, and in White Buffalo Calf Woman is the same heart that beats inside of you. It is my heart, the heart of unconditional love. I thought about how we were all aspects of our divine parents, spirits that lived within the body of the universe. Could it not be said that if everything was created by the mother and father, then the heart that lives inside of them lives in us as well? This is true, she answered, without my having to say a word. Our communication was now telepathic. Yet there are those who know it not and claim it not. There are those who flee from the hearts that beat within their own chest. The place where true wisdom and purity dwells. Many are the souls who would long to rest, but they know not where to release their burdens. What burden was she speaking of? I heard the answer in my mind, the burden of the false self, the troubled self, the persecuted self, the hungry self, the abandoned self, the unforgiving self, the frightened self. All these are the ones who run from knowing me and resting in place of all forgiveness. They have not disentangled their souls from their ego. Let me read that again. They have not disentangled their souls from their ego. They run from the memory of the divine because the world of light and shadow has convinced them that it is real. This is everything we're doing in yoga. This is everything we're doing in the shadow work challenge. Untangling your soul from your ego. Your ego is your false sense of self. The ego isn't real. And if the ego isn't real, what is real? Your soul. And your soul is not your ego. I found myself struggling with this answer. Of course, I knew that ego often blocks us on our quest towards enlightenment. The ego is afraid of dying and of not being good enough to be loved. It was the higher self that had the power to transcend the problems of this world. But we still had to deal with the challenges of the physical realms. And most of the time, these problems seem pretty real to me. But is the world of light and shadows not also real, I asked? The world of taxes and jobs, money and survival, are these not also real enough to be contended with? Contended with, yes, she said, but real, they are not. Where is it written that you must woke your lives to pain and torment? Where is it written that those around you must command your very being? With demands you did not write, but have chosen to be servant unto. It is not written because it is not true. All the burdens that you would place upon yourself, you have chosen in some way. Your jobs, your marriages, your schedule, your laws, even your taxes. These are human created. They are not of God. I felt frustrated. So you're saying we live in a terrible system, I half joke. I am saying... That this dance of life can be created in an infinitude of ways. What you choose in your world is really up to you. You and your brothers and sisters may create societies in any way you wish. You may create relationships and loved ones with any way you wish. So often you struggle against customs, morals, rules and regulations and limiting belief systems as if they are substantial. They are not. They are human created and not of God. All that we have required of you is that you eat and sleep and love one another. These commandments are written by us and no others. But why have you appeared to me in all these forms? I asked, still puzzled. My dear one, do you not understand who I am yet? I have many forms and many faces across the universe. To the degree that you are open to my benediction, you too may become a vessel for my spirit. You too may embody me, for my essence lies dormant within the matrix of your heart like a seed waiting for the sun. My linear mind fumbled to comprehend the immensity of what she was saying. 
Ariel, are you saying that you incarnated as all of these goddesses, that you were each of them? I was, I am. She morphed back into the petite figure of Quan Yen, and suddenly we were in the Lotus Garden again. There were lilies growing in the pond at her feet. In this incarnation, I was born from the tears of Avalok Ichivara, the white avatar of compassion. But how can you also be the daughter if you are the divine mother? She laughed and the sound was like musical chimes. I am the mother, I am the daughter, I am the sage. I gave birth to the son who becomes the father, who in turn gives birth to me. This was deep. It was as the entire universe were in constant rotation of male and female roles, playing out the same cosmic dance in the endless cycle of expression. I don't understand, I whispered softly. Ariel smiled. Oh, but you will. Then she began to dissolve into thin air. A moment later, I woke up. The cosmic dance. As I tried to wrap my mind around what this could mean, it seemed as if there was some sort of great cosmic drama being played out between the Divine Mother and Father who periodically descended to Earth. I thought of the sweet Mother Mary who had given birth to Yahshua and Yahshua saying that he was one with the Divine Father. Then I thought about Magdalene who was also been the divine aspects of Christ long denigrated in Western theology. If Yahshua and Magdalene had had a child then they might have essentially given birth to another aspect of themselves. This was the Trinity that had long been taught in Egypt. Divine Mother, Father and Child exemplified by Isis, Osiris, and Horus. When Osiris was slain, Egyptians believed that his spirit had returned in his son Horus, and the father becomes the son, and the son the father. Maybe this was true for the Divine Mother as well. Maybe Magdalene was the daughter aspect who had come to earth as Yahshua's partner and wife, while Almamara, Almamari, Mother Mary, was the mother aspect. In India, there are similar trinities, Krishna and Yashoda as his mother and Radna as his soulmate, incarnations of the divine feminine in two different forms. The Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Years later, I came across a remarkable gospel called the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, which addresses this very subject. And we did a huge deep dive into the Gospel of the Holy Twelve on this channel and on the Dark Outpost. We really went deep. This is an incredible, incredible missing Gospel. Like Nicholas Notovich's discovery of the unknown life of Jesus Christ, this Gospel was preserved in a Buddhist monastery in Tibet for centuries. Translated from the original Aramaic, it was first published at the turn of the 20th century by Reverend Gideon Osili, a priest in the Catholic Apostolic Church of England. The Gospel relates many of the familiar stories from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but includes chapters deleted from the original Gospels. This Gospel is believed to be the original Gospel of Matthew that was mentioned by St. Jerome and other early church fathers before the Catholic correctors rewrote and edited the text to reflect church politics at the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE. Historically, we know the Apostle Thomas went to India, and there were other disciples in China and Tibet who may have also preserved a copy of these Gospels in their original form before the church correctors changed them. By storing Yahshua's teachings safely in remote monasteries, perhaps these disciples hoped to keep them safe so that they might be recovered in a future age such as our own. Such foresight was probably the real reason that Yahshua was so adamant that his brother Thomas go to Asia, knowing full well in the, corru the corruption that might unfold in the centuries following his ministry. Yahshua even speaks about this in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. But there shall arise after you men of preserved minds who shall through ignorance or through craft suppress many things which I have spoken unto you, and lay to me things which I have not taught sowing tars among the good wheat which I have given to you to sow in the world. Then shall the truth of God endure the contradictions of sinners, for thus it hath been and thus it will be. But the time cometh when the things which they have hidden shall be revealed and made known, and the truth shall make free those which were bound. 
Woe is the time when the spirit of the world shall enter into the church, and my doctrines and precepts shall be made void through the corruption of men and women. Woe to the world when the light is hidden. Woe to the world when things shall be. We also know that the gospel of Judas that we studied on this channel was a warning about how sinister the church was going to end up becoming and being and is. The gospel of Judas is literally about how the church that was built in Yahshua's name is satanic. Interesting that all these gospels that say that were banned by the church. Censorship, fact-checking at its finest. Your church, your Bible, is the exact same as Mark Zuckerberg. The exact same. No difference. The Gospel of the Holy Twelve reveals a set of 12 new commandments, as well as a version of what would later become, as the Ni become the Nicene Creed with prayers to the Divine Mother and Father. The new 12 new commandments cover the basic on admonitions not to lie, cheat, steal, or kill, as well to honor our parents and do unto others as we would wish to be done to. But there are also new commandments to protect the weak and, opp and oppressed and all creatures that suffer wrong, to make no impure marriages where love and health are not, and to honor one eternal father, mother of heaven. While these last three commandments were not in line with the political objectives of the church, the commandments not to eat flesh, nor drink the blood of any slaughtered creature, nor yet anything which bringeth disorder to your healths or senses, was probably the covenant that the church would have resisted most, since it prompted vegetarianism. In his gospel, Yahshua tells us, I manifest myself unto you in all created forms. In so much as ye have done unto one of the least of these, my brethren, yet have it done unto me. In the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, we discover Yahshua with his disciples near a fountain close to Bethany, telling them about how the visible and invisible worlds work together, and that through the natural world we might enter into the knowledge of the spiritual world. The things which are seen and pass away are the manifestations of the unseen, which are eternal. Let me read that again. The things which are seen and pass away are the manifestations of the unseen, which are the eternal. We speak about this with yoga. What is the body? It's prakriti, it's nature. It's seen and it will pass away. The body, the prakriti, is the expression of parusha, or the soul. It's the shakti. It's the expression of the soul, which is the unseen and which is eternal. That from the visible things of nature may ye reach to the invisible things of the Godhead, and by that which is natural attain to that which is spiritual. Verily, the Elohim created man in the divine image, male and female. And we see that in the New Testament or the Old Testament as well. We see this also in the Apocryphon books that we were given the inspiration to create our bodies by the Elohim. What are the Elohim? The Anunnaki? The other races of cosmic beings that came to this earth? They taught us how to create bodies. We see this in the Emerald Tablets as well. And all nature is in its image of God. Therefore, God is both male and female, not divided, but two in one, undivided and eternal, by whom and in whom all things, visible and invisible, from the eternal they flow to the eternal they return. Spirit to spirit, soul to soul, mind to mind, sense to sense, life to life, form to form, dust to dust. This passage embraces the concepts of both eminence and transcendence, telling us the physical world is a way for us to experience the presence of God in the here and now. The two divine children of God. While Jesus addressed the creator of all as Abba Amma or Father Mother God, many of us know very little about the divine son and daughter, celestial siblings and lovers who make up the tirad of beings from which the eternal cosmos is created.
The daughter has been called the Shekinah, or breath of God, but she is also known as Sophia, the direct emanation of wisdom. We shall learn more about her in the next chapter. We learned about Sophia first in the Apocrypha of John. Yahshua speaks about the divine daughter and son in the gospel of the Holy Twelve and how these two presences continue to incarnate throughout time, returning to the world in many forms. He reminds us that the knowledge of these great beings has been taught in previous eras and that humanity has confused this higher truth with superstitious and foolishness, assessing these roles to the gods and goddesses in earlier centuries. In the beginning, God willed, and there came forth the beloved son, the divine love, and the beloved daughter, the holy wisdom, equally proceeding from the one eternal fount. And of these are the generations of the spirits of God, the sons and daughters of the eternal, and these descend to the earth and dwell with man and teach them the ways of God to love the laws of the eternal and obey them, that in them they may find salvation. Many nations have seen their day. Under diverse names have they revealed to them, and they have rejoiced in their light. And even now they come again unto you, but Israel receiveth them not. Verily I say unto you, my twelve whom I have had chosen, that which hath been taught by them of old time is true, corrupted by the foolish imaginations of men. Magdalene also addresses these same precepts in her gospel. If Christos can appear as a male, then surely Christos can appear as a female. Those who deny holiness and womanhood do not understand holiness and manhood or womanhood, but are sorely bound to ignorance. Do not believe the father of lies. Believe in the mother of spirit, whose name is the spirit of truth and comforter. Listen, the Holy Spirit is supernal, yet... She is everywhere here and below. She is the light of the heavens and the fire of Jihana, and she is the life power in all creation in heaven and earth, and beneath the earth she is the all in all. If anyone is ignorant of her, then they are surely not alive. The four trinities of God. The Gospel of the Holy Twelve opens with Jesus teaching about the four trinities that express the very nature of God. Again, Yahshua taught them, saying, God hath risen up witnesses to the truth in every nation and every age that all might know the will of the eternal and do it. And after that, enter into the kingdom to be rulers and workers with the eternal. God is power, love, and wisdom. And these three are one. God is truth, goodliness, and beauty. And these three are one. God is justice, knowledge, and purity. And these three are one. God is splendor, compassion, and holiness, and these three are one. These four trinities are one in the hidden deity, the perfect, the infinite, the onely. Likewise, in every man who is perfected, there are three persons, that of the son, that of the spouse, and that of the father. And these three are one. So in every woman who is perfected, there are three persons that of the daughter, that of the bride, and that of the mother. And these three are one. And the man and the woman are one, even as God is one. Thus it is with God the father mother, in whom is neither male nor female, and in whom are both. And each is threefold, and all are one in the hidden unity. This is exactly what Ariel was trying to explain to me. Not only did the Divine Mother take the form of wisdom teacher from China, Egypt, and the Americas, but she revealed her celestial form behind the mortal trappings. Yahshua spoke about his prionic return to the world and that of Magdalene's in this next passage. Again, I say unto you, I and my bride are one, even as Magdalene, who I have chosen and sanctioned unto myself as a type, is one with me. I and my church are one, and the church is the elect of humanity for the salvation of all. I actually do believe that some of the gospel of the Holy Twelve was tampered with, and I don't think it was tampered with nefariously. I think he must have meant temple because church was not a word that Yahshua would have used. So let me read that in the way I think that he would have said it. I and my temple are one, and the temple is the elect of humanity for the salvation of all. The temple of the firstborn 
is the Maria of God, thus saith the Eternal, she is my mother, and she hath ever conceived me, and brought me forth as her son, in every age, and claimed she is my bride, ever one in holy union with me, her spouse. She is my daughter, for she hath issued and protection from me, her father rejoice in me. And these two trinities are one in the Eternal, and are shown forth in each man and woman, who are made perfect, ever being born of God, and rejoicing in light ever being lifted up and made one with God, ever conceiving and bringing forth God for the salvation of many. This is the mystery of the Trinity and humanity, the moreover in every individual child of man must be accomplished the mystery of God, ever witnessing to the light, suffering for the tr truth, ascending into heaven, and sending forth, forth the spirit of truth. And this is the path of salvation, for the kingdom of God is within. Here Jesus is saying the Divine Mother has incarnated as both his mother and his mate. Alma Mari and his mother and Magdalene is both his spiritual sister and his mate. Spiritual sister, not biological sister. From age to age, these two divine presences incarnate, playing out the various roles of father, daughter, mother, son, and loving spouse in an eternal dance of opposites. This concept was a mind-blowing theology for the pa patriarchy of his day, and clearly too much for them to assimilate. But as we can observe, this excision of his profound revelation about the divine masculine and feminine forces in the cosmos was to create centuries of oppression and suffering in our world.